2 Corinthians chapter 5. Getting a lot of deal now with these few chapters about the ministry, the aspect of the ministry, showing the Corinth church what the ministry is about. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, our bodies, our flesh, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So there's hope. There's a blessed, glorious hope. In glory for in for in this we groan our bodies right now and earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven I want my new body I'm tired of this old body I don't know about you but I'm tired of band-aids and I'm tired of needles and I'm tired of being sore I'm tired of being pain I want that new glorified body and when I get that new glorified body I'm gonna stand before God in Jesus Christ I won't have to worry about man. I won't have to worry about, is he lying to me? Is he deceiving me? Is he true? Does he really care? Because in glory, it will be all in all without sin. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. So, unlike religions, you know, you're going to get virgins. There's no nakedness in heaven. You're clothed. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, this body, being burdened with all kinds of problems. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that has wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also has given us the earnest of the Spirit. So we've got the Holy Spirit in us indwelling with us sealed in us the glorification that one day this old rotten flesh this old rotten sin will be gone and forgotten therefore we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body we are absent from the lord excellent 100 percent true statement now, isn't it great that that's a comma, not a period? Because it goes on. For we walk by faith, not by sight. You can't see God. You can't see Jerusalem. You can't see New Jerusalem. You can't see the cherubims. You can't see Jesus. But we're to walk to him. We are confident. I say... And willing rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. So once you leave this body, as a Christian, you are with the Lord. That's it. While you're in this body, you're absent from the Lord. So what happens to a Christian when he dies? He leaves his body and he's instantly with the Lord forever. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. We do things for the Lord because he's done things for us. So laboring is part of the Christian life in this flesh. For we must also appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Oh, we're going to be judged on our actions. And he's just talking about we're, we are in this temple, this fleshy garbage. We've got to labor and sweat in this garbage that we're inside, outside. This mortality, we got to do something for God. And what we do in this tabernacle called flesh we will be judged as Christians. Listen, just because, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm born again, I'll never be judged. Yes, you will be. You may not be judged to judge to go to hell. You'll be judged on your labor. Some Christians don't work. Some Christians do their own work. Imagine uh, you take a guy, he goes into this office. And he goes, sits down at the desk, and he does the work. 
And at the end of the week, he goes, well, where's my paycheck? And they're like, who are you? Well, I'm such and such. You're not an employee here. Well, look at all the work I did. I don't care what you, what you did. You're not an employee here. You don't get no wages. What I'm saying is there are some Christians out there they're serving the wrong labor. They're doing the wrong work, and they're not going to get nothing for it. But they think they're working. And they're not working for the right person they're supposed to work. They're working for the world. CEO, uh, fishing trips, uh, vacation, all the junk. Well, that's not our labor. God, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ is our laborer. You work all you want for the world, but you you get your benefits here. You serve the Lord and you'll get your benefits in glory. Judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. What you do in this tabernacle? I've got sin. It's, if it's not under the blood, it's going to have to be called out. According to that, he hath done. What did you do? What didn't you do? Whether it be good or bad. So a Christian is going to be judged, and we, we come across many places about this judgment seat of Christ. Everything you've done, everything, let's, let's put it this way. Let's put the senses. Everything you heard, everything you smelled, everything you saw, everything you touched, and everything you thought is going to be judged. Right or wrong, it will be judged. Judged by fire. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. Fire will not try you. It will try your work. Gold, silver, precious stones remain. Wood, hay, or stubble burns. While you're in this tabernacle, in this flesh, you're not present with the Lord. You're absent from the Lord. You're supposed to be laboring. You're supposed to be going out in all the world and preach the gospel. You're supposed to be telling people. You're supposed to be helping other brethren, not putting them down. Putting brethren down, gossip, is a bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. What's the terror of the Lord? Just because you cry and prove a pity party at the judgment seat of Christ because all your stuff is smoking and ashes... He's not going to give you nothing. He's a holy and righteous God. If you don't deserve it, you don't deserve it. That's the terror of God. We persuade men. Get going, get working, get doing something. <clears throat> Why? It's judgment's coming. But we are made manifest unto God. God will make us all to know who we are, what we are one day. You will find out about every Christian in your church, why they came, the moment they came. Did they really like you? Did the preacher really have his heart into it? What did you do? Did you really give because you wanted to or did you have to? Did you do something because you had to or because you wanted to? Your deeds, my deeds, will be all made manifest, never mind to people, but to God himself. One of those manifestations I would say would be simple as thing. All right, when you're standing at the desert seat of Christ, oh God, look at all the money I gave to you, right? All right, here's all the money that you gave to me. And on the other scale, here's the, the pile of tax receipts you got every year. Hmm. I wonder how that would end up. Manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. God has given us a conscience, and you better not sear it. You better not kill it. You better have God working that conscience. Say, you know, am I? And listen, there's been times I've given money, and uh, and I've given money, and then you know, sometimes the flesh brings it up. Well, why'd you do that for? You, I've done things. I've sinned, and my conscience is is ruined by it. it it's it's burdened. God will show us our faults. Before our faults show up at the judgment seat of Christ, that way we can get things right and put it under the blood.
So see how merciful God is? He's just not going to, boom, okay, here you are, judgment. I'm going to judge. No, he warns you. He has given us a thing called a conscience as a warning to keep things right. And when your conscience bothers you, you need to get it right. When God speaks to you and says, hey, there's that sin. You got to get it right. There's a sin that I read through the Bible and say, Lord, I, I, it's under the blood. Yes, I'm guilty, but it's under the blood. I am very sorry for doing it. It's under the blood. And I'm not just saying, Lord, to cop it out. It's under the blood. Lord, I'm truly sorry. See, that conscience is there saying you did what you weren't supposed to do. It's better to have your conscience show you what you done that you're not supposed to do than have God show you what you weren't supposed to do by fire and lose out and then have everybody watching. At least with your conscience, you could be by yourself and no one can know. But the judgment seat of Christ, all the Christians are going to be watching. If your parents are saved, your parents are there. If your spouse is saved, she's going to be there. If your children are saved, they're going to be. They're going to watch everything. Uh huh. I see what he, why he did that. I see why Daddy did that. And I think too many Christians are going to be found hypocrites at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't play with this act everybody puts on. I, I believe exactly that. An act. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, the Corinthians, but give, a, give you, the Corinthians, occasion to glory on our behalf. Go ahead and praise the work that Paul's saying that we're doing. It's okay to praise someone else. Say, so, you know, this missionary, wow, look at all the great work he's doing. Look at the place he is. Wow. But don't let your boasting be of yourself. Don't boast of yourself. Don't make it so that other people will boast about you. It's called a testimony. A testimony is, you know, what you've done, someone else will give you the credit. And not you giving the credit. And again, when we manifest ourselves to God, there are some people that do things in the church so people will acknowledge the glory. The glory before man and not before God himself. That's a sin. That ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Listen, all by myself, what I am is to what God. But my outward appearance, my being of living right, is so that you can see how to be right. But as a Christian, no one's with me 24 hours a day. And that conduct that you don't know about my life, and you wouldn't want to know about my life. God knows. And I know there are people watching me saved and lost. And I'm, and I'm not putting on a spiritual costume. But, you know, to God, he knows what I've done. To the world, I've got to put on a Christian in his proper conduct. But even in that, sometimes I may be thinking something I ought not be thinking. I may be doing something behind the scenes I ought not be doing. Now, God knows about it. Other people may not. And all that's going to come at the judgment seat of Christ. Our motives, our heart. I may look good on the outside, but... Too many people don't know what the inside's like. And listen, there's sins in my life right now. They're under the blood. But if they were never under the blood, you'd be shocked to know what it's gone through on my life. And I'm not going to tell you. And you're not going to tell me what you've done by guarantee. We would be shocked on what you've done in your life. But God knows. And one good thing about God is, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess it, he forgets it. You know, you can do a brother wrong. He can forgive you, but it's hard for him to forget. 
So we have an inward appearance. We have an outward appearance. Sometimes our inward appearance doesn't back up how we look on the outside. And sometimes our outside appearance to people is, you know what, we're masquerading what we are inside. There are people, there are families that come to church, they'll come, they're all, you know, happy and all that. And once they, they've been fighting all week. They've been having troubles and problems. There's a man that will come to church somewhere in the world. He sits in the pew, and then when he gets home, man, he's guzzling alcohol as it was a soda. God knows about it. But we are to live our lives right, but we are also sinners in the flesh, in the eyes of God. For the love of Christ constrains us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Okay? I'm dead in Christ. But all this flesh doesn't act dead. It acts alive. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Stop feeding the flesh well, that's a hard one and if you're not watching yourself your flesh will catch you never mind the enemy you take this flesh off guard it'll do something that will agonize God live to ourselves let's live for Christ but unto him that died for them and arose again. Forget yourself and live for Jesus Christ. And we fail. We sin. Attitude. Lay, uh, uh, temperance. Patience. Imaginations. Thoughts. Words. Man, if we only dedicate our life 100% to Jesus Christ rather than ourselves we would not be in the trouble that we're in you check out the, the top 10 of the the 10 commandments most of them are the flesh for uh, wherefore henceforth know we no men after the flesh yea though we have known christ after the flesh yet now henceforth know we him no more this flesh, there came a time that when we came to Calvary, we were 100% in the flesh. No spirit with a little guidance of the Holy Spirit. Then someone opened up a Bible to us, they witnessed to us, and we came to Christ with full flesh. That's against God. That's against the holiness. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, are you a Christian? He is a new creature. You're new. You got a new life. You got a new birth. You got a new start. We're supposed to be not old. Old things are passed away. That flesh, the lust, the desire, the sin. They're gone. They're supposed to be gone. Passed away. Well, what to how do you use those two words in life uncle joe passed away that's the same words we use for death we're supposed to put this flesh in the grave in the death and bury it in a grave remember that baptism remember well here we are i am i am now saved by the blood of the lord jesus christ and i'm going to put this young man i'm going to put him under the water signifying death and he's going to come out of the water as a clean new creature And then you turn around, there's a zombie you walking. Sin! 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 Get rid of it. And listen, I got the same trouble. I got my own zombie sin. And you can beat them with a, with a shovel. You can smash them with a sledgehammer. You can shoot them with an Uzi. And he'll still come out of that grave. Sin! Sin! 
And he ain't going to stop until the day I physically die, mortality, or the Lord raptures me into glory. But we're told by Paul to follow Christ. Be of God. Forget that flesh. And brother, that's hard because we read in Romans, Paul says, that what I want to do, I don't do. That what I don't want to do, I do. Paul fought the, fought the same battle. We all fight it. Man, we could, hey, we got victory, 24 hours victory, no sin, all right, and then blow it. The biggest problem you got is yourself. You realize you got you got two natures living in you. You got the old nature and you got the new creature. You got the flesh and you got the spirit. And we'll read it. I think it's Galatians. Man, they don't get along. So the old things are passed away. Your old friends, your old music, your old habits. You're a new creature. You now have a Bible. You are now clean. You now have good words to use. Behold, all things are become new. You know, you're, you're, you're learning new things. You're learning about Jesus. You're learning about new things in the Bible. And the one day we're going to get a new Jerusalem. We're going to get new heavens, a new earth, a new body. And all things are of God. Who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. We were at enmity with God. We were at war with God. You can never say God hates the sin and loves the sinner by that verse right there, verse 18. How can you say God loves us in our sins before we're saved if there have to be reconciliation? If God loved us while we rejected Jesus Christ, there would be no need for reconciliation because God loves us, right? That's wrong. For God so loved, past tense, the world. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you receive that love back. Then you become a child of God. Then the reconciliation is counted to you by Jesus Christ. And then, okay, now you have that fellowship retained with God. Now you're the new creature. Now you're not who you used to be, an enemy condemned by God, but you are loved. To reconcile us to himself by Jesus Christ. So your only way to get to God by reconciliation is Jesus Christ. No one, nothing else. And have given us the ministry of reconciliation. What is that ministry? What is it that I preach on the streets of Daytona Beach? That only God can save you. And the only way to get God to be pleased with you is by God's righteousness. And that's Jesus Christ. When you preach the gospel, you are preaching the ministry of reconciliation. And that reconciliation goes back to what? Himself by Jesus Christ. If your message of gospel is not Jesus Christ as the answer, as the way, as the truth, as the life, you don't have God's message. Even if you're talking to somebody with a gospel track, even however you're witnessing to him, you're proclaiming the gospel, you're proclaiming God's reconciliation. You are telling them, say, listen, God is angry with you. God does not want to have anything to do to you or with you except by his son. Other than that, God don't want to hear your terms. Come now, let us reason again. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That whole thing in Isaiah 118 is based upon the Lord Jesus Christ and the sacrifice set off by God. Because anything else ain't going to make your sins as white as snow. Let us reason together. Let's look at the scriptures. Let's see what God has to say. That's not man saying oh, to God, well, I think it ought to be like this God. And God's like, oh, gee, I guess so. No. It's not what man says. It's what God says. To wit, that God was in Christ, 
reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We've got the gospel. We've got what God gives to man by Jesus Christ. We were in the world. We are no longer of the world. Marvel not the world hates you, brethren. Know that it hates me first. I was a worldling. I grew up since September 6, 1968. I was a worldling. April 1987, I became a Christian. I became a child of God. I was reconciled to God by Jesus Christ through the word, the gospel. Nothing else. Listen, I went through that merry crap. I went through the candles. I went through the mass. That did not please. That did not get me right with God and reconciliation. Not one bit. Not one wow. When I came to Jesus Christ that Saturday afternoon, that was reconciliation right there in my grandma's living room. God said, that's what I want. Now put his name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Angels start rejoicing in heaven. And the next day, I took that message of reconciliation, which I didn't even know happened in my life. Didn't have no being to know what anything would happen. I took that message of reconciliation to my dad. Now then, we are ambassadors. Ooh. I'm an ambassador. I better not be an ambassador like Clinton and lying. I better be an honest, truth-bearing, new creature ambassador for Christ. When the world looks at me, they're supposed to see Christ. You know why people don't want to have anything to do with Jesus Christ today? You'll witness to them. Hi, my name is Stanley Hayward. I'm a born-again Bible-believing Christian. I got this little gospel track to tell you how to be saved, or I like to tell you that you need to be saved. Well, I know a preacher that ran off with a piano player. I know a guy in church who, who swindled the money. I know a Christian who, who he's an alcoholic. I know somebody, I knew this person, uh, this person did this to me. You're not a proper ambassador. If somebody can use you as an excuse, and it's wrong, but if you can be used as an excuse for somebody not coming to Jesus Christ, you are an improper ambassador for Christ. As wrong as it be somebody using you as an excuse, still. When somebody witnesses somebody and they know you, they should say, you know what, I knew a guy. I didn't like that guy, but man, I didn't like him because he, he was weird. He he did right. He was honest. And, and uh, I just, that's the kind of ambassador. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Keep yourself to God. How do you do that? Put that flesh in the grave. You can have God angry with you. Remember the Lord's Supper he talked about? Some are sickly, some are weak, some are dead because of sin. Sin, even though you're saved, you're born again, you're saved. And if you sin, you can close that veil between you and God. God can say, listen, that's my child, but man, he's just so filthy. You ever have a child, and they're going outside and play, and that kid comes in, and they're as filthy as filthy. You get in that shower, and I don't want to see you till you come out clean. And that's how God is to us. Reconciliation now is you put your sins under the blood of Jesus Christ. You get things right between you and God so you can restore that fellowship. Now, God's not angry with you after salvation to damn you, but he's angry to say, I don't, I can't use you. You're an unclean vessel, man. Look at you, you're tarnished. You're... Clean up, 1 John 1, 9. For he has made him to be 
sin for us. That's Jesus. So what's that mean? The sin, the Lamb of God, which take away the sin. Notice the singular. If I were to right now take a piece of paper and write down the sins I've done since I can, far as I can remember, I can name more than one sin, and that right there is plural. I mean, that one right there is singular. My sins are plural. Why is that singular? Why is it the Lamb of God which take away the sin singular? Because there's no difference of sins. All have sinned come short of the glory of God. All the sins are as equal as, as any other sin. And Christ took all the sin of all the world. I know a guy who one time was talking to someone at a shopping plaza. And this little old lady with you know, the bluish hair and all that was witnessing to her. And, and that little sweet old lady, grandmother probably was it. She told him, there is no way that God could forgive all the sins I've done in my life. And you got to look at that like, what could this sweet old lady do? That she thinks that God cannot wash her sin whatever that sin was in her life and yet christ became all sin you know how much sin jesus became when he when that sin was poured upon jesus on that cross the heavens darkened and god closed off heaven he said i don't even want to see i can't even look at my son because of that sin now there's another remarkable thing that i preached it this morning he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. And there are people who are going to stand off for the rest of their life until they die thinking that what they can do is much better than what Jesus done. And I signed my name to it. I said, you're a fool, Stiley, William Hayward. That's my name to it. If you're going to think that what you can do is better than Jesus Christ, you are a fool. And I signed my name to that statement. Because he didn't know any sin. And not knowing any sin, he took our sins. Not just mine, yours. And all you got to do is receive him. All you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, you made the payment I want to sign at the, at the bottom of the line to receive that payment. God. Now listen. God became sin. That's almost an impossibility. And yet he did. You know what another impossibility was for Christ? To die. He's God. Yet, he died. You know what another impossibility was for God? For me? God to go to hell, and yet, he went into hell to deposit those sins. There are three impossibilities. To take on sin, to be sin, to die for my sins, and deposit my sins in hell. That we, we, me, me, we, we, might be made the righteousness of God in him. If I have any righteousness, it's God's. My righteousness is Jesus Christ's righteousness. Because if I wanted to pay for my own sins, that's the eternity in hell. Then I, then I, listen, I want to honestly say, okay, God, I'm going to pay for my own sins. Thank you very much. Okay, that payment and the receipt will be done when you're finished swimming in a lake of fire. I used to tell the men at prison, I said, when God casts you off in the lake of fire, there's a clock there. There's no clock, but this is the illustration. There's a clock there, and at 10 o'clock, you can get out of the lake of fire with your receipt, and you can say, God, I paid for my sins. The only problem is that clock has no hands. Now, you can do that to pay for your sins. Or you can read Isaiah 53. You can read the last 
chapters of the Gospels, and you can see what Jesus Christ done for sins. And you can say, hey, um, let's see. God was tortured. God died. God was brutally mistreated for my sins. Okay. Or I can burn in the lake of fire for all eternity for my sins. You really got to think about that? And yet, how many weeks have we been downtown and not one person who was we far as we know will come up forward to receive that gift of God? And it's already been done. No one will change their place in hell for you to get out. No one in hell is going to say, oh, I'll spend an extra period. There's no time. So you can get out of here and go to, and it's not going to happen. So with Christ becoming our sin. And dying for our sin, who knew no sin, why can't we put a little more effort in serving and worshiping him instead of this lousy flesh, which I lose the battle to? And in case we forget, as we go backwards in this chapter, we're going to play this, this chapter backwards. Christ died for my sins, knowing no sin, that I ought to be living for him because he's done that. And the sole response is, God is watching me. God can say, hey, your sins are separated, you and me. You're saved, but you're filthy. Or far as the world is, your sin, you being a worldly man, you can't, I can't even have anything to do with you. you got to come to Jesus Christ. And those that are saved, there's a judgment seat coming. There is judgment us coming. And it's all going to be manifested. Whether you're a phony, whether you're faking, or whether you're sincere of your heart, you will be judged. Oh, I was married for 50 years. Yeah. At the judgment seat of Christ, was it really happy 50? Did you really, really enjoy that marriage? Or did you just... I never missed a day of church. Yeah, we'll find out why you never missed a day of church. We'll find out the motive. And then, backwards from that, after the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to get a new body. We'll never have to think again. We'll never have to, uh, is this going to be right or is this going to be wrong? We'll never have pain anymore. We will be in an eternal body given to us by God. No more Absolutely no more sin. How's that? This chapter goes forward and it goes backwards. It's a wonderful chapter. And it's chapter 5. And I, I heard some people, 5 in your Bible is a number of death. I heard somebody say something else. And No, Genesis chapter 5, and he died. And he died. And he died. And he died. Go check it. And he died. God's been so wonderful to us. Why can't we be so wonderful for the love that he's shown us? 